to Raj from Crocodile Games. Let's see what we got. Hey Raj, the game 3,000 years in the making, it finally happened. <laughs> Enjoy Fitz. Oh! <laughs> Greetings, demigods and harbingers. Raj here with uh, something a little different today. We're doing a review. I received a copy of the War Gods of Olympus limited edition hardcover in the mail, courtesy of the owner of Crocodile Games, Chris Fitzpatrick. So this is going to be a very light how to play video. And maybe I'll just elaborate further on what the game offers so you can determine if this is something that you want to check out. I've actually played this game for many years i uh, painted up several war bands i've since sold them off but i did keep a model from each and then actually the models we're going to be seeing in this video the spartans were painted by me these were done for a friend of mine so how i got involved with this game was a long time ago so i used to go to gen con every year uh, for a long time warhammer and games workshop had no presence at Gen Con. So I was a Warhammer player. I needed my miniature game fix if I was going to go to Gen Con. And I chose War Gods. I'm glad that I did. The models are awesome. And I played in several of the events there and had a great time. After a while, I kind of stopped going to Gen Con. And that's kind of how I got out of War Gods. Well, that's enough about my personal history with the game. Let's talk about the history of the game itself. So it began in the early 2000s. War Gods of Egyptus was released to the masses. And my local game store actually carried a lot of these miniatures, uh, which was pretty cool. There weren't a lot of tabletop miniature games options back then necessarily. I like to think of the game as a little precursor to the current miniatures game explosion we are going through right now. The game was War Gods of Egypt. So I think immediately there was kind of a problem with some people adopting this game because you could look at it and say, well, it looks cool, but I'm not really into Egyptian things. So pass for me. They announced War Gods of Olympus, I think, maybe before they were quite ready to just to show even if you don't like Egyptian miniatures, you can still play this game because we've got uh, Greek minis on the way. And then uh, the Wendigo, these ferocious beastmen from Hyperborea, were also released to kind of show that um, you can. we've got a whole universe here. So Crocodile Games is a small company, and they've been working on the Egyptus, Wendigo, and the Olympians ever since. It's been a long road, but finally we have a copy of War Gods of Olympus. So finally, let's get to the rules themselves. So if I had to give a, the briefest of descriptions, I would say Warhammer Light, but Warhammer 5th and 6th edition Light. So if you have some nostalgia for the old days of ranks and flanks, uh, perhaps this might be the game for you. So the scale is a lot smaller than a typical Warhammer game. So a warband. You might have two, three, four units of 10 to 15 models, a few characters, monsters, a chariot or two running around. So as we delve further into the rules here, let's talk about the activation system. So I think that is going to be the main hook of the games. And I think it was kind of ahead of its time because nowadays we're expecting some kind of interesting mechanics. Uh, I'm kind of done with all my guys move and all your guys move. And you know, I need something a little more, a little more crunchy, a little nuttier to to go with. And War Gods delivers there. So at the start of your turn, in a game is typically five, six, seven turns, perhaps you're gonna lay down order tokens for all of your troops. So each individual unit. So there's um, a hidden side. You know, the actual turn left order, as we can see right here on one side, and then the other side. You know. It's just covering up, keeping secret what you're up to. So you have to come up with a plan ahead of time. So you're going to roll a D10 for the edge. And if you blow your opponent away, you get three activations to start with. 
Um, otherwise, typically you get one, you know, you're the first person to go. So that can be a big deal if you're trying to activate a unit. But you can flip over your orders or your opponent's orders. You can make them activate if you want to see what they do, for example. So let's start with the most basic order, which is advance. So one thing I should say is your troops move like classic you know, Warhammer troops. So they're in blocks. So they go forward. When you move to the right or left, you have to wheel. Um, you can turn in place, back up, do a few different things. But so the, the units of troops are very uh, constricted um, in the kind of classic Warhammer sense. So you are sort of really committing yourself to a plan with these orders. Now there is some leeway here. So let's get back to the advance. So basically you can move up to that troops movement value straight ahead. Now most troops, a typical value is five. Six would be fast for infantry, four for the slow guys like the totanum, the rock guys and Egyptus are movement four. You can do a one inch shift to the left or right, but that is pretty much it. So you can go up to that max and then you have to go at least the minimum so if you know the circumstances change around you before that unit activates uh, you can still kind of hold back so you're going to have some flexibility turn left and turn right so for the units this is when they wheel to the right or to the left so you have to go at least an inch and then you can go up to the full movement value uh, the characters for the most part are going to follow kind of what i say but they are a little more nimble, a little different. So for a turn left, turn right, for example, they just kind of pivot in place up to 90 degrees and then they can run in that direction. So there is a fast advance order and that's for moving at the double. So you have to move at least your normal move. So typically five and then you could go up to 10. Troops can cannot typically fast advance unless they're in a column formation. So you do have a few different formations, like a, typically you fight in a block, but if you want to go fast, you move into a column. Getting in and out of that is actually pretty, pretty easy. So you will find yourself uh, putting your troops into a column formation. Um, there is a fallback order. So you can uh, basically move directly backwards. This is your move minus one inch. Uh, one cool order is charge. So th there is some nuance here. You can't advance into combat, but typically you're going to want to charge into combat because you get a basically a plus one to hit bonus. And what's cool is if you are charging a unit and that unit also has a charge command, they can sort of flip it and it's kind of like an interrupt. So there are some kind of interrupt type things. Basically, you guys will meet in the middle and you both count as charging. So <laughs> that's pretty cool. You do get to move double and then basically when you activate that's when you make your attacks so you just fight when whenever you're activated is when you fight so if you guys counter charge you fight at the same time if you set for charge you will fight before the guy who charged you um, and then um, that's kind of generally the order of things so you might activate a unit to fight after you won the edge because it's really important to kill a couple guys um, but the, you do some damage, they hold. Well, now there's you know, not necessarily any advantage to activating that unit to fight back. So that might be you know, the last activation because um, it's not going to necessarily change things perhaps. A couple more orders here, attach, detach. So characters can join units and uh, they can pop out. So it's kind of cool using these. You, um, if you have a character in a unit, you give a attach, detach order down and then you put whatever order the unit's going to do on top so you're kind of like secretly putting down two two orders i was felt really sneaky doing that so you can put down those and uh you know so the unit can do one thing and then the character kind of peels out you know he picks a direction and basically runs that way um, there's a fire command if you are shooting so you can wheel one inch before you shoot kind of align a little bit but otherwise you uh, you know basically shoot whatever missile weapon you have so you always have to shoot at the closest troops unless you have a character in there so often having like a cheap champion model is useful for your shooters uh, a couple more orders so there's a pull about order so this is used for not the units but the characters can basically turn around and run backwards. So the fallback, you maintain your direction, 
but the pullabout you turn around this is also used for the chariots but well, let's talk about chariots right now so these are one of my favorite things about this game so the rules are pretty pretty granular there's a lot going on here but I think mechanically it's really fun to use these and so chariots are fast so they move eight to start with um, you can get some upgrades to armor them up and slow them down a little bit but for the most part you know eight you can move up to 16 in a fast advance now uh, interesting rule so to get up to that speed you have to go from a start to advance and then a fast advance in order to move at the fast advance <laughs> speed so uh, and then if you're stopping like if you want the driver to shoot you have to go down to an advance and then issue a hold to finally stop and then the driver could finally shoot in that situation but typically you don't need the driver shooting because he is uh, working the reins on that beast so now the cool thing is the turns which the faster you are going, the wider your turn is. So, like, if you want to do a real quick nimble turn, you got to go slow. And then as you're going faster, sort of the radius of your turn increases. So if you're moving at 4-inch speed, the radius is 2 inches. If you're moving 16 inches, the radius is 8 inches. And I think just looking at the tape measure here kind of explains that better than any of my words. Now, with the chariot, you have a couple cool options. So the passenger can be throwing missile weapons this entire time. Um, you can drive by units and whack them with your weapons as you go past. So the passenger can get off. So you can run the warlord over and drop them off. You don't necessarily want to risk the chariot in combat because it is kind of squishy. So you might drop off your warlord and just have the chariot hang out and wait for him to get done with his fight and then hop back on and then <laughs> drive across to the other side. Now, one of the cool things is uh, if that were to happen and you killed the driver, so you could have an unoccupied chariot. And whenever that happened, that became my absolute mission was to steal that chariot. So you can, if you can get to that chariot with a character model, you can hop on and take the other guy's chariot, which is amazing. And I remember I did that in a tournament finale, round three. And I think that was the difference. So my opponent tried to count uh i couldn't claim victory points for the cherry because i killed it so we got it's because i didn't kill it uh but the to came over and he said and i remember this today well it's not like they're gonna give it back so <laughs> it counted as victory points um and i had this chariot and so that's always my goal is to steal a chariot whenever one shows up unoccupied on the battlefield uh because i i think that's just the coolest if you do want to fight in the chariot, you can charge a unit and you can actually, if you kill every model you're touching, you can actually pop through and keep on going. So that is pretty hard to do, but uh, it is possible. So you can have a lot of fun with chariots. I always recommend taking one or two when you're building a list, even for the Olympians. I think they'll be a great option. So there is a new unit type with War Gods of Olympus, and that is mounts. So in Egyptus, nobody really rode horses. You just use them to pull a chariot. Um, I, there was a there is a beast master who could ride an elephant, but for the most part, nobody was riding anything. In Olympus, that's very different. So you have Amazons riding horses. So there is a war band that's primarily mounted, and then most of the troops will be foot slogger hoplite types. But for example, you could get heroes on the Pegasi stags lions griffins what have you so the mounted models uh, kind of get a speed bonus from the horse and then they actually get an extra wound so uh, the horse will get killed from out from under them so you need to have a foot model for your mounted guys uh, the characters at least so i believe that doesn't apply to the actual troops but um, i think that's kind of cool i don't know if you can steal a horse um, I will have to look up oh, I just found it there is a rule to steal a horse um, so that will become my mission and the war gods of Olympus so let's get in a little bit of the mechanics the stats of how you're actually fighting and stuff like that so so troops have a movement value typically four five or six like I said you have an attack value typically three four five you have a defense value in that range you have a missile attack value also in that range and then you have a discipline value, which is used for making route checks, disorder checks, stuff like that. In this game, there's two types of roles. There's tests and there's saves. 
So a test is taking your value, subtracting your opponent's value, and then adding it to a D, uh, D10 roll, and you're looking to get a six or better. So I think that was kind of wordy, but if you are attack five and your opponent is defense five, you guys are even, so you will need to get a six or better on a D10 in order to hit that model. So if you are attack six and they are defense five, you'll need a five or better. If you are attack seven and they are five, you will need a four or better. Um, so every point of difference improves it. Or if you're attack five and they're defense six, then you're gonna need a seven or better to hit. And uh, a 10 will always hit. I can't recall offhand if a one is always a miss or not. But so those are the tests. So to attack in close combat, like I just said, it's attack versus defense. If you are shooting, you are rolling attack, missile attack versus range. So the other type of roll is a save, and that one's a little simpler. You just have to roll equal to or lower the number. So if you're taking a route check, that's a discipline save. So you take the discipline value of the, the unit, or if you have a hero model in there, you can typically use his. So it might be a six, seven, or eight, and you just need to roll less than that. Armor saves work the same. So typically your armor might be two, three, four, or five, something like that. You just need to roll equal to or under that number in order to save it. So that's the framework, those are the basics. Let's run through a combat right here and see exactly what I'm talking about. I'm using Egyptian models here. The combat units for the Olympians generally use the phalanx rules, which have a couple of extra differences here and I wanted to keep things basic. So here we have a Sebeki Harbinger lining up against a Tethru Harbinger. So the Sebeki are the crocodile men of Egyptus. They have two wounds each, which is unusual, and attack value of six, and they are the, the best fighters in Egyptus. Lining up against them, we have the Tethru, which are the, hands down, the weakest fighters of Egyptus here, with uh, attack and defense of three. They have a higher arcane value to make up for it, but it doesn't matter too much for the most part, except when it comes to their master of words or wizards. But to make up for it a little bit, these models are piled on with medium armor, double-handed weapons, and bows on top of it, while the Sebeki just have double-hand weapons. So we're just focusing on the two units lined up against each other, and we can see both of them have an order queued up. The Sebeki win the edge, so they choose to go first, and they flip over a charge order, so they will be going forward and kicking some butt here. They have a charge order, so they will go forward at double speed in a straight line. Once they connect with the Tethru, they will align. Now, the Sebeki are wider than the Tethru, and only models that are touching actually get to fight in War Gods. So we're going to have to count it out. So like I said, the Sebeki are attack 6. Now, when you charge to the front, you add 1 to your attack value. The Tethru are defense 3. The difference between those is a 4 so the Sebeki here will hit on a 2+, plus, not too shabby. They did miss once, sadly. Now the Tethru have medium armor, which is, gives them an armor save of 4. The double-handed weapons reduce this by 2. They have a damage of 2. Normal hand weapons have a damage of 1. And missile weapons are generally damage 0. So instead of needing a 4 or less to save, they'll need a 2 due to the giant mallets these crocs are wielding. And unfortunately, they do not make any saves. Five Tethru go down. So a route save is required at 25% casualties, at 50% casualties, and every time you suffer casualties after 50%, and in that latter case, there's an additional minus one penalty. You can't see it, but these Tethru have a hero in there, which raises their discipline value from five to seven, and there is a banner in there, which adds a further plus one. So they need to make an eight or less on this route save which they do by rolling a one, so they are good to go. So at this point, the Sebeki have attacked, but the Tethru will not attack back until their order is activated. So this could be immediately, if that's particular advantage, if there was other units fighting somewhere else on the battlefield and it was better to activate one of those, you could just do that and then circle around to this at the end. But once you're engaged, whatever order you had, automatically becomes a hold order, except in one case, which we'll touch on later. So these Tethru are gonna fire with their bows. Instead, it becomes a hold command, which means they fight. So the Tethru are attack three. 
the Sebeki are defense four. There's no charge bonus or anything evolved, so they will need sevens or higher to hit. And look at this amazing roll, four hits. Ah, oh, that's got to burn the Sebeki player. So the Sebeki have a natural armor of two. Natural armor just means that it's already included on their profile. But the Tethru have double-handed weapons. So normally they save on a two or less, but the double-handed weapons are damaged too. So they completely nullify the armor of the Sebeki. The Sebeki have two wounds each. Four wounds becomes two dead Sebeki. And now, remember, I did say there was a hero in here. A uh, hero's attack values are two higher than the base trooper. He will hit on fives or better with his two attacks. Boom, two tens, not too shabby. And he also has a double-handed weapon, so these will become wounds automatically. So the Sebeki have suffered over 25% casualties themselves. And their discipline is five, is average. They have plus one for a banner, so they need a six or less, and they roll a nine. So they will move double their move value back to their table edge. If the Tethru had an unspent order at this point, they could have pursued or attacked the Sebeki in the back as they fled. And usually you have to spend your order to cause the route check. So typically the pursuit or attacks in the back don't happen unless you have multiple combatants involved in the same fight. So let's take a look at a couple alternate reality situations here between these two units. So let's say the Tethru Harbinger won the edge and had been able to activate the Tethru first. So we're going to go through a shooting example now. So missile attacks are broke down into short, medium, and long range, depending on the weapon. A javelin short range is 4 inches, for example. A sling is 8 inches, and bow is 10 inches. And then the medium range is double that, and the long range is triple that. So a bow's maximum range is 30 inches. You compare the missile value of the trooper versus the range of the attack. Short range is a 3 difficulty, medium range is a 5 difficulty, and long range is a 7 difficulty. In this situation, their bows are within short range. The Tethru are missile value of 4 versus difficulty of 3 for short range, so they will hit on 5s or better. For shooting, the first rank is considered to kneel, so the first two ranks can shoot. The hero does have a different missile value, so he should roll separately, but I just decided he didn't have a missile weapon. So I just rolled 11 shooting dice here, needing 5s or better. So 6 hits. The Sebeki have the natural armor of two, so on twos or less, they will save, so they take five wounds. So we pull two off, one takes a wound, and they must take a route save. Let's see how they do this time. They succeed. For this next one, the Sebeki will have a charge order. They'll move across, attack. I'm not going to roll the dice. Well, let's say they completely whiff. So I said before, every order except for one in close combat basically becomes a hold and you fight. But one exception is the fallback order. So this allows you to retreat from close combat. This order requires you to make a discipline check. The Tethru have a value of eight, remember. They succeed by rolling a one, so they will fall back at their move value minus one, which is four inches. If they had failed that check, it would have been considered a route instead. They would have moved back at double speed. And if the Sebeki had an unplayed counter, they could follow up or attack them as they flee. Let's take a look at that same scenario, but let's say the Tethru Harbinger had won the edge. So he was able to play the fallback command first. Since the Tethru are not engaged in close combat, they wouldn't require a discipline check, so they can essentially just move back their move value minus one inch. Now the Sebeki player still has a charge command, so on their turn, they're gonna go forward the full eight inches. They're just a move value of four. However, it's considered a failed charge, so they must take a disorder check, which they fail by rolling an eight, so they are considered disordered. When you are disordered, the only order you can receive is reform. Now, you will fight back in close combat, but if you do have to take a route check, it will be at a minus two. So I think these two examples really demonstrate the strength of the order system. You really get a feel for the cat and mouse, hit information, bluffing, sort of gambling feel to everything. The sequence of things is huge, and, and when you throw in the fact that Sebeki player wouldn't necessarily know there's a fallback order. It was Tethru could add a fire command or a charge. Just makes for very interesting games. So let's talk a little bit about warband construction. This is one area between the two books, Aegyptus and Olympus. There are some differences. One thing that's not different 
is your main man. It's a demigod in Olympus, and then in Egyptus, it's a harbinger. So this is a mortal imbued with some uh, supernatural power. So this is very important. Your whole warband revolves around this, guys. So in Egyptus, there's all these fun races, and I like I like the constrict in that game because you choose a race for your main guy, and then most of your warband has to be uh, the same race as that guy. Uh, but you can mix in humans freely, and then you can take as many allies as you want. So there's no <laughs> there's no race war of all oh, these are the dwarves versus these are the elves. Uh, you can mix freely all the different races of Egyptus, which I think is really cool. And so that's kind of where you get your variety. So the Basti, the cat creatures, are great missile shooters. And then the Sebeki, the giant croc guys, are just ferocious warriors in close combat. Now in Olympus, it's a little different then. So you choose uh, your demigods, divine mother or father. So Ares, Apollo, uh, Athena, you know, we have a long list here of those gods. You're going to choose your gender because that could come into play with certain abilities. And then you choose your city state. So you kind of have your base stats determined by, you know, whether you come from Sparta, Corinth, Athens. And then you could, depending, you know, any one of those city states could have a demigod of any one of the gods. So there's a lot of variety here. And the warband construction there is a little different, so you, but, but kind of the same. So it's all humans for the most part. So you have your heavily armored hoplites, which must take up about 50% of your warband. Then you could take uh, peltis, archers, uh, kind of auxiliaries with the points left over, and then allies and kind of special hero models available to each troops, which kind of give you a lot of variety. Now that is how most warbands work. So I'm leaving out the bad guys from each of the expansions. So in Egyptus, you have eaters, which are your undead, your mummy, and those beautiful mummy models. And uh, those guys follow rules that are similar for the most part um, with warband and everything like that. But in Olympus, you have the titans, which are completely different. So those are these are ogre sized at the smallest up until the overlord, who's a big a big bad boy. Uh, at one point I did own an overlord model and it was several pounds of, of metal. I don't know if they're resin at this point, but it's just a huge monstrosity. And this was kind of before the big plastic Games Workshop models. So he might be kind of dwarfed now by some of the newer kits coming out of GW, but at the time, this is like 2006, seven, eight, um, that was an amazingly huge metal model. And so their rules are kind of different. So they'll have a lot of characters running around and just a few, unit of the, a few units of the Titan slaves kind of bulking out the force. So the last thing I really want to dive deep into is the, the campaign section. So a huge portion of these books are devoted to scenarios and campaign play. And I think the system really lends itself well to that style of play. So if you guys want to get a campaign going, I think the War God system is a great setup for that. So like I said before, your Warlord's strength can vary between 1 and 10, depending how much Iker or Ka your Warlord has. So these battles are all about the these Harbinger and Demigod fights. So actually, when you are playing, if you get the Harbingers or Demigods in base-to-base -base contact, fires up what's called a provocation. So that's like a duel to the death. Both of their uh, supernatural energies are entwined and uh, sort of like Highlander. One, one person is going to come out of there and nobody else can interfere for the most part. And uh, you know, one man takes all. So you actually steal the energy from your opponent. You lop off their head. And during a campaign, that works perfectly. So you start with like one power. There's a full chart. There's 10 more powers that you kind of roll randomly and see what you get. Um, so it really lends itself to campaign play, powering up your guy. It's all about the warlord. What was cool about Olympus is it's broken down into land scenarios sea scenarios and then underworld scenarios so you can even set the background for where the campaign is taking place and i'll just wrap it up i had fun when i was playing this game 
I'm definitely going to hold on to these figs for a while and get in a game or two against some buds and see perhaps if we can get some interest going here. So I think there's a few reasons you would check this game out. One, the core mechanics are simple, easy to learn. There's a lot of nuance with the activation system. If you're playing ranks and flanks, I would definitely check this out. For me, I like this a lot better than the Kings of War or Ninth Age. I play a lot of Saga, Infinity. I need an activation system, which has some interesting uh, twists and turns available to it. So this does it for me for sure. Uh, the models are great. These are classic, uh, sort of 90s nostalgia feeling, just looking at these. They're great. They're, they are all metal, so that may be a pro or con for some folks. And lastly, the campaign system. There's a lot of thought that went into it. I think this would be a great campaign game for a group of guys or gals to dive into. If I'm being realistic about the downsides of this game, I would say Crocodile Games is a small company, so the pace of releases isn't necessarily that quick. So if you're used to uh, Games Workshop, for example, um, you might see like there's not a lot of buzz, not a lot going on. If you are used to playing Saga like me, the scale of release, the, the pace is perfectly fine. But uh, depending what you're used to, it might seem kind of slow. And then within the, the books, I think Olympus adds a lot of variety to the units and the different options you can take. Or with Egyptus, you're kind of more uh, stuck with what you have. So you build a warband and then you kind of, you can mix and match for sure, but the troops are very similar. So it's kind of just whatever you want to take and you'll probably be fine where... Um, if you into building lists and you know, min-maxing and stuff like that, um, I don't think this is for you. So maybe that's a pro circling back around for some people. For the most part, you just take what you want and you're going to, it's fine. You know, you're not at an advantage or disadvantage necessarily. So um, yeah, they're just well-balanced games. If that's a con or a pro for you, I guess it's a pro for me. I'm not sure why I'm bringing this up in the con section, but um, I think Mr. Fitzpatrick's plan worked, sending me this. It's got some ideas flowing, thinking about the good times I had in those mid-2000s as a younger fella, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to diving in a little bit more. If you have any questions specifically, I will answer them. So I did a high level, but I, in the comments, I will dig as deep as you want me to, and I will answer your questions. If you play this game, let me know as well. If you have models for it, these would also be great for Saga Age of Magic, so you can get some double duty out of those if you are one of my Saga followers. Otherwise, that's going to be it for this one. Thanks for watching through to the end here. Like, comment, subscribe. I will talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. If you'd like to stick around for some extra credit, I've got gorgeous low resolution photos of my warbands from the mid 2000s here. An infamous Anubai warband, a peace loving Kemru warband, a couple Olympus models, and a Wendigo warband was the last one that I did. Enjoy.